big number is what we what we uh, it's, it's beyond human scale or something like that. So first of all, I try to uh, speak about uh, exponentials, and it's a very good way to to do big numbers. And in, in fact, whenever people are asked to participate in a big number contest, most people use exponentials because it's the, it's the time of numbers they know that are big. So I also need to clarify or, or at least agree on what the things like these mean, like nine to the nine to the nine. Does it mean uh, uh, that we packed numbers from below to up upwards or the other way around? Because this is very different. So what we uh, what we do is, okay, is, is what we do in mathematics. These are very, really different numbers. Uh, the first one is just 78 digits, but the one is more than 300 million digits. So we stick to the big one, so the big choice. We like big numbers and we, we would like to, to have numbers as big as possible. So how big can we reach? The first man that appears here is Archimedes. He wrote the Sandra Corner which is a book in which he tries to count, to actually count the number of sand grains in the universe, if the universe was full of sand grains. And therefore he needed a notation to, to write big, very big numbers. He, he was at the time there was the use of Roman numbers and to, Roman numbers are not good for, for using, uh, for writing big numbers. So he invented a whole notation of different orders of numbers. So in a sense, he's the inventor of this exponential notation that we use uh, in our days. So this is the biggest, a big step. Um, to clarify a bit, a bit on quantities, uh, we say that, uh, the, well, it's an estimation of the number of stars in the universe is two to the 23. So it's not bad, it's a big number, okay, already. There's another big number, which is the uh, 20 to the 85, which is the estimated numbers of atoms in the, in the observable universe. There's much bigger numbers like this one. This is the number of multiverses, according to the theory of multiverses, as an estimation. And this is the biggest number in literature, is the number of ways to sort the books in the library, in the Babylonia library by Borges. So this is one of the, this is probably the biggest number in, in literature. So this is a big number. Um, but uh, in any case, why we need such big numbers if the number of atoms in the universe is already 10 to the 85? And then we come to computers. This is, this is a picture of Gary Kasparov losing to Deep Blue in the 90s. Uh, and we say, okay, yeah, that, that might be because uh, uh, Chess is a complicated game and, the comp and how complicated it is, we can measure it by uh, guessing how many possible games are there in chess. And it's all the order of 10 to the 20, to the 120,000, uh, sorry, 10 to the 120. So that, that's uh, the size of a chess game. There are the more complicated uh, games in this respect, like the Go game, but okay, computers are a good place to search for, for big numbers. How big is, are the numbers computers can deal with? Uh, well, there's a notion of computability. And uh, this notion of, com of computability, there's a famous uh, theory, a famous statement in computer science, uh, which is the uh, church Turing uh, thesis that says that computability is the same as recursion. So anything we can do recursive can be computable. And we have some experience with recursion, like for instance, in defining the factorial. This is um, primitive recursion, uh, saying that the parameter in which we do the recursion is the numbers. So there's a parameter in, for instance, here is, is this five factorial is uh, five times four factorial. So here we have the, the recursion based on the numbers on which we are computing the factorial. In general, the n factorial is n times the factorial of n minus one. So this is something uh, we can compute because recursion is computability. But then came Ackerman and Ackerman showed us that recursion is much more powerful than just uh, primitive recursion. And Ackerman invented somehow non-primitive recursion in which 
the parameter for the recursion is no longer the number, but the function itself. So let's try to have a look at this. We all agree, oh, sorry, I put vethes instead of times, but <laughs> I forgot the translation. Uh, we all agree that multiplication is addition a number of times. We can agree that, that exponential, exponential is multiplication a number of times. So why not going on? So we can define the next uh, operation, uh, this double arrow, that the, which means that double arrow n double arrow to the m is n exponential uh, n times m times to itself. So and we could go on. We could define a new a new function called the three arrows, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And this grows very very fast. And this is still recursive. It's non-primitive recursion, but still recursive. Therefore, this is computable. How fast do, does this grow? This is the Ackermann sequence. It's, an, it's a computable sequence, which uses the first natural number with the first operation. That's one plus one, that's two. Second Ackermann, Ackermann number is the set, second natural number with the second operation, which is four, and so on. So the third natural number with the third operation is the third Ackermann number and so on. And already the, the fifth one, five to the triple arrow of itself, is bigger, much bigger than those numbers we've saw, we've seen those exponential exponential number that that we saw. There are several notations, and it's very important. Well, this this number, this five with triple three arrows, um, I think we could not uh, have any hope to write it using uh, the our use use uh, usual notation. So there are other notations to write this kind of big big numbers. One is uh, due to Donald Knot and other to Conway, but I will show you today the notation given by Moser, Moser polygons. Uh, this notation means if we have a triangle, a number in a triangle means that number uh, raised to the power of the same number too. Uh, so n in a triangle is n to the power of n. In general, n in a polygon is the nodes n in n, polygons of one side less. Uh, we will see an example in, in, a, in a minute. So n in a k side polygon means n inside n k chi minus one, k minus one polygons. For example, how big is four in a square? So four in a square by definition is four in four triangles. So here we have four in four triangles. So let's undo the first triangle is four to the four by our notation. So it's 256. So here we have 256 in three triangles. Well, let's undo the inner triangle and we have 256 to the 256 inside uh, two triangles. I won't do this number. So this is uh, the next triangle. And finally, this number four in a square is 256 to the 256 raised to the 256 raised to the 256 and all raised to 256 to 256 raised to 256 raised to 256. So this is a huge number. Uh, I mean, if, if we were to write this number using our digital positional notation, then we would run out of atoms in the universe just beginning to write this, this number. This is a huge number. So this is how fast uh, Ackermann sequences grow. Another example, let's, let's have a look at how far in a pentagon is. This is where people in high school in particular just jaw drop. Uh, four in a pentagon is by definition four in four squares, right? So if we undo the first square, we know how it works. So undoing the first square, we have that huge number in three squares. So to undo the next square, we, sh we should, we would have to write that big number in that big number of triangles. So if we were to just draw the triangles one triangle in every atom or particle of the universe. We couldn't just write the triangles. And still we have to raise to the power, to the power, to the power again, once for each triangle. And we still have two squares left. So this is a huge number, a very, very big number, but still computable. If we have a computer powerful enough 
to compute these kind of numbers with enough memory, then we could compute this number. No problem with that. So is there anything beyond that? Here we have uh, 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 Turing. So Turing already, uh, when inventing computers, was uh, facing the problem of what are computers capable to do? What are they able to do? Is there any number that computers will, will never be able to compute? So far beyond Ackermann numbers? Well, uh, the, the Turing machine, Alan Turing machine, is, is his uh, concept of, of his model of computation, consists of an infinite tape, well, infinite, uh, as, as big as we need a tape, with ones and zeros, and a read and write head, which uh, uh, reads and writes ones and zeros in the tape, according to a program that it has. So Alan Turing uh, and everything a computer can do can be modeled by this uh, universal Turing machine. Uh, with, there, are, there are different uh, models for these Turing machines, but this is a very simple one. But anything can be reduced to this simple model. Everything computable can be done with, a comp with this model. I mean, uh, we could compute five on a pentagon using uh, such a Turing machine. It would probably take a lot of time and, and resources and tape, but it is computable. So Alan Turing, already in the 40s, he uh, wrote his uh, famous paper on computable numbers. And there he proved that there are some problems a computer, a Turing machine cannot compute. In particular, the halting problem that asks, if I give you a program, can you detect, uh, decide in a finite number of steps if this program will ever stop or not? And that problem is uncomputable. So, and that's approved by Alan Turing. So then we come to Tibor Rado. And Tibor Rado, Hungarian gentleman, he invented a kind of numbers that cannot be computed by a Turing machine. And let's see how these, how are these numbers. So the first Rado number, he called them BC Beaver. He gave a model of computation with programs, Turing programs in cards, and saying if you find a one, then then uh, move to the left or to the right, write a one or a zero on the tape, and then go to the next card, etc. So he, his first number, his first busy beaver is, among all the programs with one card, those programs that stop in the Turing machine, which is the one that writes the biggest number of ones in the tape? So, and that biggest number of ones is the first uh, busy beaver, the first busy beaver number. In, I can tell you this is one. With two, uh, among all programs with two cards, which is the one that writes the most, the biggest number of, of ones on the tape? Uh, among all the problems that, uh, are among all the programs that stop with two cards. That's the second number and so on. So the nth BC Beaver number is among all the programs with n cards, uh, those, that, that which, uh, that who, those, those which stop, eventually stop, which one is the ones that, that writes the biggest number of ones on the tapes? That, that's, the, that's the BC Beaver number. And the BC Beaver numbers are these, as far as we know. So BB1 is one, BB2 is six, BB3 is 21. We know that BB5 is bigger than two millions and something. We know that BB6 is bigger than 10 to the 36,000, etc. But we don't know this yet. And these numbers are not computable. Why are they not computable? Because if there was a Turing machine that, can, that could compute every, beaver, every BC Beaver number, every BB, then if I give you a program with N cards and I compute the BB, I start running the program. And as soon as this program exceeds the number of ones given by the BCB, I already know this program will not stop. And therefore I will solve computationally, I will compute the halting problem. And already Turing proved that the halting problem is uncomputable. So by reduction to the absurd, I'd say, uh, we can prove that busy beavers are not computable. So these numbers are beyond anything computers can compute, in particular beyond Ackermann functions. So just to, to summarize, we know now how to win a big number contest. For sure, we know about the importance of notation in mathematics. Uh, we couldn't write these big numbers only with Roman numbers, so to say. 
We have some ideas about non-primitive recursion and computability, perhaps we learned a little bit about the history of computation. And uh, I can tell you where we can our curiosity on big numbers. And okay, thank you for listening. This is the, the contact, uh, uh, the way to contact me. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Eduardo, for this nice talk. It's, it's really interesting to, to learn about this, uh, these numbers. My, my steps and always ask me what's the biggest number there is. <laughs> and right now I have some, some, some answers. I, want, I was wondering if there is some small numbers that are interesting because no one never refers to them. Hmm. The most, uh, there, there are, for example, these, these, these strange notations uh, maybe uh, this notation left behind some some numbers, you know. Yeah, yes. Uh, the, for small numbers, they are interesting. Uh, also, in the in the context of computation, because uh, what is the smallest number that we can express with a computer and with an n-bit computer? So there is a strong work on that because sometimes we need precision. And for precision, we need to be able to really express very, very small numbers with computers. So there are, for instance, subnormal numbers is one of the concepts. So these are this is the smallest numbers that cannot be expressed by a computer in, in digits using floating point precision. And also for measuring the complexity of algorithms, uh, probably the best algorithms are those who grow as slow as one over the Ackermann function. So the Ackerman function is used in computer complexity to measure complexity of algorithms and is, is, is used in its natural form. So to see a program that grows too fast and also uh, one over the Ackerman function gives us a way to measure programs that uh, grow very slowly. So they are good programs in this sense. Thank you so much once more. You can have, uh, give a round of applause to, to Eduardo. There is uh, uh, some emojis that you can use here online. And um, maybe we can, uh, we can uh, jump to the second uh, talk of this, of this session. It will be given by uh, Andreas Matt. Uh, Andreas is the director of Imaginary, a nonprofit organization for the communication of current research in mathematics based in Berlin. He received the media awards of the German Society of Mathematics for his achievements in communicating mathematics. So welcome, um, Andreas. Hello. Hi, Valerio. Hello, everybody. Um, I'll share my screen and uh, jump into the presentation. Uh, can you see the screen? So um, yeah, Imaginary is a nonprofit based in Berlin, you, you said already, and we do um, interactive mathematics exhibitions and uh, it's all open source and we do exhibitions, we do museums, but um, somehow we also do a lot of other formats. And one thing that we do a lot is software-based exhibits. And this is also what I'm going to talk uh, today or uh, to show you. Yeah? So, um, the, the first part of the talk is a showcase. So I'm going to um, uh, take you along a journey to uh, different types of uh, software tools that uh, communicate mathematics or that engage a large audience into um, mathematical theory. Uh, I put a few keywords here and I want you to remember them. And um, if I now take in, in the journey, in the adventure of the, all the different tools, maybe you look at some of these keywords and, uh, and see what, what do you find? Do you find something like a creative interaction? Um, I like this uh, word creative interaction. So that's something where you as a user of the software tool could even surprise the author or the authors of the tool. So you can really create something new. It's not just an option, options that you choose from. Um, maybe there's something like humor, which is always very strong in com communication. Um, of course, let's have a look at the mathematical depth. How much can you explain or how much can you self-discover using that tool? Um, design and user interface is a very, very big part. I'm going to talk about this in the second part of the talk where uh, we see like issues in developing these tools. Uh, and something rather new is this kind of gamification or let's call it the, the entertainment part. So how much fun it is to, uh, to play with these tools. Uh, I start with a tool which was maybe the, even the start of our uh, uh, imaginary adventure 
it's a tool that you might that you might know. We uh, developed it in 2007 and have further developed it a lot in the last decade. <laughs> uh, it's called Surfer. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's, a, it's a tool that features a lot of these keywords and uh, I still like it a lot. And I think it, it's really one of the, one of our, of our core exhibits. So it's a tool where you um, can visualize in real time algebraic surfaces. So it's a real time ray tracing program of algebraic surfaces. So you have the equation here in three variables and you just change um, just a second. Okay, I have my kids here. So, that's all. so you can change the equation, um, and you see here the surface um, in real time, and you can just play play around uh, with it and, and look at it. You can change the colors, and there is a, a big gallery of surfaces that are already prepared. So this is the famous uh, equation of all the points that form this heart shape. There's always this good uh, joke: if you change the last cube into a, a square. Um, in German, we say the heart falls into your uh, pants, uh, which means that you get um, a little bit uh, like shocked or, um, and this is kind of like a heart with a slip, but it's the equation of a heart with a slip. Um, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of mathematics that we can explain. The whole uh, thing here of um, singularity theory. Um, so here, this is the very famous Bart sextic, which is, um, uh, like a sextic, so it, it's an equation of degree six, and it has 65 uh, singular points. And you can also look at uh, open questions in, in algebraic uh, geometry, um, looking at surfaces, um, which are where you don't know yet how many of the singular points you can have for a certain degree of an equation. With this tool, you can um, create, it, create them, you can print them, um, and you can, uh, can really use it as a tool. So it's like a painting program. I'll, I'll stop for a second here um, and jump uh, back to the, uh, to the talk. Let me just see. Is it here? Um, so, okay. it's interesting because Surfer is a tool that you have to you have to install. So it's it makes issues even with just this screen sharing. So um, I show um, now in the last years, the, the web technology, that's also something very important for the software development, uh, developed a lot. So now we can do something like this even in the web browser. So this would be a web browser version um, of the same program. And it uses uh, the graphic card of your computer. So it's very fast and you can just embed it in a website. So, uh, which is really cool. And this is an article that was featured in the New York Times uh, about Valentine's Day, and of course there is a heart, but it's also about algebraic surfaces. I'm going to jump to our next uh, tool, and um, maybe that's also a set of tools, and that's interesting, I mean, if you work in software, you can also just combine different tools. So that's something that we use a lot in museums. So it's like a station, a touchscreen station, where you can show a lot of different types of mathematics in very small experiments. So um, for example, you can just play here with polyhedra, um, I don't know, you, you, you start with a, a platonic one, here this one, and then you just, um, um, I don't know, cut, cut the edges and make a football, for example. Or um, you take something else, you shrink the faces here, and then you say, okay, I start, I start here again, I have this magic wand, and then from here I cut the edges and I can create all different types of polyhedra. You can make them transparent and change the colors. So again, it's like simple, um, here are options and you can play and create, create uh, your own uh, polyhedra. But here we also have um, tools where you, for example, play with the um, symmetry groups in the Euclidean plane. So that's a very nice tool where you can uh, choose one of the um, symmetry groups and then you just uh, play uh, and paint and see how, how it will change. You can also see here the, um, the fundamental cell. You can zoom in and out and, and do your own ornaments drawings. Um, so this is, this is, these are very small uh, experiments. Some of them, of course, you can do in hands-on format. Like this is just, you know, it's a double pendulum. Um, you can, of course, build it in real time. But what's nice in the, in, the, in the software world, and that's why we like it a lot, that you can just, you know, I don't know, you change here the, the length of the penduli, pendula and uh, you can observe it. You can even change something that you cannot do in, real, uh, in the real world, gravity. So this is gravity. I just put gravity to zero. 
and I see how it looks like for almost zero. I can put gravity to the right side. And then of course it looks different. So it gives you a lot of options to really uh, play and have this kind of quick feedback. Um, I show you another tool which is connected to, uh, to Portugal. The, the surfer one is also connected to Portugal. So we did a lot of algebraic uh, um, surfaces and competitions in Coimbra, 2012 and 2013. This is a project uh, which was um, also um, made in collaboration with the University of, Lis of Lisbon. So this is um, um, an update of a uh, pro program where you can play um, with projections. So you have the classical projections. Um, talking about mathematics, you can also here add a little bit of more information about each projections. And you can look at, um, I don't know, here the uh, Tissot indicatrix to see how the projections would behave. Um, for example, um, on, the, on the equator, and you can play with geodesics and uh, loxodromes. So um, there's a lot to play around here. Uh, yeah, one thing I, for, I forgot, um, I prepared all these links and that's also nice with the software program. So I, I'm going to share this now. So I invite you to also play along. Uh, so uh, I just share um, a document here. So it's this one. So you can, um, so that's like, the, you see the slides of the presentations and all the different links of the showcase and also um, of other interactive software, not only done by Imaginary, but done by here, for example, Attractor in Portugal, we, we, an organization which is very active in, in interactive software uh, engagement, but you would also have here um, from the US or from Russia, different other programs. So feel free to open it and, and play along. Um, I'm going to jump on now um, to two tools that we developed for our, uh, one of our latest exhibitions on mathematics and music, um, current research on mathematics and music. And that's a tool which is very, um, uh, I call it very complex. So um, it doesn't look like very complex. So you can say, okay, I, I, I can I have here timber. It's called scale lab. So it's all about scales. So here um, I say, okay, I, I take simple, like a simple waveform, like the sin, sinus waves. I can put here in the analysis um, section, I, I put it on wave and then I can just play and see a wave. I put it a bit loud so you maybe you can hear it. So I have the keyboard, but I, you can also play here um, in limited, like the, the, the tones without the keys. Yeah? You, you see the keys connected uh, to the tone um, line here. Of course, with the keyboard, you just select uh, certain ones. Now the question is, which ones do you select? Um, so one thing you can do is you just play with the timber. You can also just add overtones and see how this would, would change. You can also play uh, chords, for example, like if you had two or three at the same time. And you can start analyzing them with um, like the ratios. So that's already interesting. So to see what is the, like the difference now, I'm, I'm, I'm using a tuning, let me put it in English. I'm using a, um, an equi, uh, equal temper tuning. So that's the, the tuning that we often use nowadays, but you can also jump to a the classic Pythagorean tuning or um, also jump to Indian tunings, gamelan tunings like the ragas. So that's also something nice. Now I changed the timber, so maybe I'll put this back to another, another one. So it's a, it's a big, 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 big tool set of playing with, um, with tuning, with dissonance curves. So it's the Helmholtz dissonance curves. How can you uh, tune a keyboard? You can create your own tunings. And uh, here, talking about the mathematics, there was no way to put all the information inside the program. So we just prepared a booklet. So it's a lot of pages. Um, where you can play with this program. So here you can play with the spread partials, this on the, in, on the ragas. Uh, it's, so it's all explained and then information is outsourced into a booklet because it would be too much. Another tool, um, which is a lot of uh, fun. Let's see if the, can you still hear me? The, it says that the internet connection is not very good. Okay. Okay, I, I somehow lost the internet. Are you still here? Yeah. Okay, I, I show you something. This one is not loading um, from our latest exhibition, which is on mathematics and artificial intelligence. You also find the website. So these are two or three, like five tools that we put online. We have about 15 uh, different uh, interactive tools that we use again from museums and exhibitions to play with neural networks, to play with different core algorithms um, of AI. And um, I show you one quickly. So this is a very simple network, uh, which is a recognizer of, of uh, 
handwritten numbers. So you put the number here and ideally the AI would recognize uh, what you do. So this one is called numeric numbers. I can just share it with you here. I think I didn't put this one in the link list, but you can also just train your own neural network. So this one, um, bigger. So this one is like an empty, like a, a network which is not trained yet. So it um, should not really work properly. And you can just train it with a lot of images and see how it gets better and how it changes the connections of the network. Um, we have a lot of tools that show you how neural networks work from inside, the, the mathematics of it. Um, we have developed a game um, here talking about gamification. So this is like an, uh, it looks like an old Atari 80, 80s game um, where you play a boat and you have to find a treasure hidden on the, uh, on the bottom of the sea. And what you can do is you lower probes down to the bottom and, um, and you get uh, feedback on the gradient uh, wherever you lower your probe. And then you can see, okay, how do I find the, the bottom part if I always go lower? So you actually self-discover uh, gradient descent. You discover also the issues. So you have local minima and, um, and you can find here, for example, for Maslow's proof uh, and very nice mathematical treasures. This is a game that you can also really like play with two people or three people um, like a real computer game. Um, to stop the showcase, I show you our latest project, which we are just about to, to officially launch. So it's already online, but we're still fine tuning it. Uh, it's called Matina. It's also done in cooperation. It's, it's a European Union project in cooperation with Attractor and, and other partners in, in, in Italy, in Slovenia, and in Finland. And this is like an interactive storybook, um, also especially done for also young, young kids and for schools and school teachers. Um, so here you have a, a whole world. So we developed these two characters, Matina and Leonhard or Leo. Uh, her smaller brother, and they discover a lot of mathematics in four different continents. Um, I can show you quickly. So this is like the young for younger younger kids here, age four and up. Um, of course, you need somebody to, to guide you or, or to read. So um, so you have a story where, for example, they meet um, this ancient. Um, it's a, actually she's a firebird trainer. She's called Flamma. Um, you can also find it in different languages. It's also in Portuguese. And so you can read and click and there's the whole story of these dragons that she's training and the dragons they have there, the unicorn. But um, as kids, if they, uh, you know, they lose their, their milk unicorn, you know, that, like the first unicorn they lose. And if you catch that unicorn, then you can actually train the dragon. And um, so there's a lot of stories. I, I don't know, many, many, many hours of stories and inside the stories, you can play. So there is, um, I don't know, maybe 30 or 50 interactive apps. So this is a very simple one where you just fly around. And um, actually this whole story is all about um, vectors, geometry. Uh, it goes also a little bit into surfaces and curves. And this is what would be just very simply. Um, so you have the direction you fly around with the dragon, but it gets very, very uh, complex. All right, so I'm going to stop here with the showcase and um, Jump back to the, um, the presentation. Okay. Are you Do I have to, uh, one more minute or? No. So um, just to finish, one thing I put in my title is this hybrid engagement. Hybrid is a, uh, like a common word. I'm I'm not sure about the uh, about the like the official definition, but nowadays it's used a lot in this combination of offline and online. And I really like um, this kind of software tools because we use it mainly. In, in offline contexts. So it's, we use it always in, um, I don't know, in real workshops or in, in real museums or in real exhibitions. But nowadays you can also do a lot of uh, ritual like we do right now. So we did a lot of workshops, especially on the AI world, like 450 workshops, four day long workshops virtually where you can all show these interactive tools. And since it's, it's tools that you can easily copy and it's tools, a lot of things happen. And I really like this. So this whole question of target groups um, we, we define it for a general audience and then you have this kind of, I don't know, we, for example, here there's the chef in, this was in Malaga in Spain. So he, a Michelin chef, and he started to, to use the surfer tool to prepare dishes, so mathematical dishes, or there's a sort of like a, a fashion show uh, here on the left where they use surfer to design fashion show or you do outside exhibitions. That's the same thing. Sorry, I have my, my kids without the visitor. So, um, and so there's a lot of options you can do. Now, um, issues. So what's the issues with software? Um, I put maintenance here on top. Maintenance is a big issue. So um, you do something and after one year, it doesn't work anymore. After three years, it doesn't work. So soft, this whole 
topic of software what? It's really something you have to maintain all the time. It has become a little bit better nowadays because you do software, or we do software a lot in the web. So use uh, web technologies. So usually it's also easy. You don't have to install it, different uh, operating systems. So it's kind of more easy, but that's the whole thing of what platform you use to, um, for your software and the technologies. That's a big, big issue. Then it's very difficult to really do a very good user interface. This whole kind of have a nice design and the user interface has to be simple, but in a way also allow for all the options. So that's, a, of course, that's a big, uh, a big thing. Um, and it's also changing all the time. Sometimes, you know, first you use sliders, now you, use, you have multi-touch and so there you have new te technologies, new interface, uh, interfaces, um, and that's, that's very important. And of course you need a, a, like a team of developers uh, to develop it. What we do a lot is we use uh, simulations or mathematical software tools that are already there and just on top put the user interface. Yeah, so. um, all right. Um, feel free to con uh, connect to us if you if you want to know more or if you you have an idea for a good new software tool that we can jointly develop. We uh, everything you have seen here was developed in, in collaboration with a lot of um, mathematicians. So that's that's our normal way to work. Uh, so there there are a lot of universities and researchers involved. Um, all right. Thank you. I'm open for questions. Okay, thank you so much, Andreas, for this nice talk. And um, we don't have so much time, <laughs> but anyway, I was wondering, do you have um, some control uh, over the, 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 the kind of people visit, that are visiting your, um, these, these, these places, these, these exhibitions online and, and so on? Yeah, um, I mean, we, we collect um, anonymous statistics. Um, so we know uh, the countries they're coming from. We don't know the age group. And mm -hmm. we know the browsers they use, so we have okay. like, digital data. Um, um, we know who is who is uh, doing the workshops, or like if we do the workshops, then we know. So it's a lot of, uh, for for example, we, we did a lot of school uh, workshops and teacher training workshops. Um, so I usually it's age, age twelve and up. Um, but um, for the locally organized exhibitions, of course, you see the people who are coming to exhibitions, and this depends a lot on the venue and on the marketing. Of course, if you're in a supermarket. So we do, we, I, I like to do these exhibitions in public spaces. So you get a completely different crowd than if you do it in a university museum, sure. for example. So, but um, yeah. I was wondering if you can, can attain, say a large part of this general public that goes just because they are interested in math. Or, or, is, or, is, or if it is essentially schools and people that no. are studying math. Um, it, I think it depends a lot also on how on on on, your, on our marketing skills. For example, this this boat game. So uh, it's used a lot because it's a game, and and we kind of managed to to disseminate it well via social media. So it's, mm -hmm. it's all the question how how you get the link to it if you just work in the virtual field. We still believe in working in real environments. So for us, it's still like installing this in a big science museum. I have my two thousand visitors every day. And then it's the visitors of that science museum, for example, if it's a big one. So I, I still prefer to have it um, in, a, in a museum, but I also like this kind of pop-up exhibitions or going to the streets, um, like yeah. this kind of, and what I think maybe like a, as a, as a final sentence, um, I think it's still, we at least still have this kind of human um, guide next to it, you know, that helps, that helps you discover. That's why, um, you know, just preparing a software just for your own, that, that also works and a lot of people are using it for you like on their own and even on mobile phones. But I still believe that um, mathematics communication need, needs somebody to motivate you or to, to help you in, in the discovery or to help you, to guide you, be with you. And I think I, that's why I, I strongly believe in exhibitions where you have somebody, uh, somebody there. You know? Okay, thank you so much again for this very nice talk. Uh, we are already running five minutes late. Uh, so let's jump to, to the, the, the third um, talk. Actually, this is not really a proper talk. This is, well, this is uh, Rita Vieira uh, was, is someone that, um, he, he, she is a retired math, a mathematics uh, professor. And she, I, I learned from, uh, her collection of puzzles from a common friend, uh, Je Paul Vienna. And um, I don't know if she is here. Uh, I don't really know because I, I'm afraid not. But anyway, uh, she, she told me that, well, the best way to, to, to show 
her collection is to doing a video. So she sent me a video and that's what I will show you. So I'll show you the video of her showing her collection. So let me uh, share my... Um... Ana Maria Rou, uh, uh, Rita está aqui ou quer dizer alguma coisa ou não? Não, não. No, <laughs> okay, but that's it. Oh, by the way, this, this is a video in Portuguese, but well, you will see and you will understand most of it, I guess. So let me share. Could, could you, uh, can, can you have the sounds? Could you just, um, because I'm not sure, because someone told me that it's uh, something it's needed. Do, uh, sorry, right now I don't, well, if you don't have sound, you tell me. Então, 
os meus alunos, eles diziam que era na Gisela. Na Angola, parece que não, não pode sair, mas o problema é sempre o mesmo, é ir procurar o buraco e ela sai. As partições de figuras planas, a mais conhecida de todas é a partição do quadrado, mas aquela mais conhecida é o Tangra. Os pentaninos são também uma junção de quadrados, cinco quadrados. E estão aqui os 12, sem haver transformações geométricas. Eu lembro-me que em, em 1990, um grupo de professores de matemática do núcleo da APM ao lado da Seixal concorreram a um projeto na altura do IE para construirmos uma espécie de ludoteca a qual chamamos esse projeto Matelab e deparamos com imensa dificuldade em arranjar materiais para esses ditos que nós queríamos que fossem laboratórios de matemática. Não gosto de ter as coisas fechadas nas gavetas porque é preciso muito espaço e não há prateleiras, nem gavetas, nem paredes que cheguem. Aqui também a cor. Lá em cima são várias partições da esfera. Aqui nesta, nesta prateleira é um conjunto de puzzles que utiliza a mesma técnica. Portanto, há sempre uma casa vazia que que nos permite que nos permite mudar o meu puzzle este, este quando está resolvido é muito bonito porque ficam as cores todas em degradê aqui temos o, o, o cubo o cubo mágico de facto foi uma invenção do Rubik húngaro que quis explicar aos seus alunos de arquitetura planos e cortes e sem saber muito bem como inventou este puzzle que eu acho que é espetacular e é de facto o puzzle do século XX. Se o XIV foi o puzzle do século XIX, este é o puzzle do século XX. Vou mostrar o cubo mais pequenino que tenho e penso que é o, o puzzle mais pequeno que tenho. Portanto, é, é o, o cubo de um centímetro, de um centímetro, de um centímetro e pasme-se de roda, posso resolvê-lo. Nesta prateleira aqui embaixo são os puzzles, mas em madeira, de madeira. Gosto de ver esta madeira toda colorida. Lá embaixo são, lá embaixo são os cubos, são a ser preso e o objetivo é construir o cubo. De vez em quando, eles também são todos com elástico, mas a junção dos cubinhos pequeninos com o elástico não é a mesma. Portanto, por isso é que estão aqui. Numa coleção deste tipo, não podia faltar o leque. O leque tem um, tem um defeito. Para já, esta série, por exemplo, da arquitetura, é bastante despendiosa e ocupa menos, menos, muito espaço. Então. Dizem os amantes do, do Lego que as pessoas que não têm espaço passam para os nanobloco. Nanobloco são pedrinhas de Lego, mas deste, deste, desta dimensão. Os fases 3D em cristal são difíceis de fazer porque as peças são como o nome indica, transparentes e muitas vezes não se percebe a partição das peças e onde é que se tem que encaixar as peças. Tenho que procurar sempre perceber eh, a matemática que há nos jogos. Uma questão, por exemplo, eu sei, eu sei, eu li algo que este puzzle é usado em certas tribos indígenas para os repasses só passam, digamos, à idade adulta se conseguirem resolver este tanto. Aqui tenho uma, um conjunto de
puzzles, quebra-cabeças, que são chamados os quebra-cabeças de destreza. É quase. Mas é impossível. Bola grande no chapéu, a esfera grande no chapéu vermelho e a pequena no chapéu. É preciso muita destreza manual, muita paciência. É engraçado este, porque isto é uma, uma reprodução de um puzzles, puzzles desse tipo antigo. E uma, uma, uma secção de labirintos, mas aquele que não encanta é este que um, é um bocado de mercúrio que tem que se fazer este labirinto portanto, com muito cuidado para o mercúrio não se partir e vai por aí a fora aqui também neste armário tenho aqui esta gaveta que é aquelas coleções todas todas quebra-cabeças estes são todos de madeira aqui ainda são aqueles de, de, de quebra-cabeças de destreza não podia deixar de falar no 1415 1415 um, um puzzle que tem uma casa vazia para mim ver e as peças e por as peças por ordem é muito mais antigo que o Sandloy. O que o Sandloy fez foi registrar a patente. E registrou a patente e fez mais. Pôs a circulação uma situação que não tinha solução. Quando o 15 está antes do 14, é uma das posições que não há solução. Este, dada a sua... Dada a sua... O aspecto deve ser o mais antigo que tenho, já, já com espaço, mas não com aquele sistema de poder encaixar as peças. Parte desta estante dos livros né? começa em baixo e vai por aqui acima. São tudo de bibliografia relacionada com jogos e com matemática. Um T, uma partição que é o T, não é muito fácil de fazer, porque qualquer pessoa que se senta aqui começa a mexer. A Torre da Anói. A, a, a Torre da Anói, toda a gente conhece, acho eu, é, é do, do, dos jogos que eu acho mais engraçados, porque permite trabalhar durante a escolaridade toda. Eu acho que o miúdo pequeninos na pré-escolar acham piada mudar os discos de um lado para o outro, então, sobretudo, se eles são às cores. Depois, mais tarde, um ano mais tarde, podemos dizer, mas olha que não podes pôr nunca um, um maior em cima do mais pequeno. E isso é mais uma aprendizagem. E eles... Depois, é um jogo que progressivamente se pode utilizar uh, para aprender matemática. Porque ali, mais ou menos ali no nono no, no ano, pode-se tentar que, que os alunos descubram qual é o mínimo de movimentos que é preciso possível fazer para, para, para resolver o puzzle, portanto, pode-se trabalhar as progressões geométricas, pode-se tentar, mais tarde, que eles consigam encontrar a forma, digamos, qual é o mínimo, como é que se encontra o número de movimentos que tem de fazer para passar esta torre que está neste pino para este pino para o este ou este sempre com as duas regras só posso mover um de cada vez e nunca pode o maior ir para cima do mais pequeno um, tive a experiência que alguns miúdos chegaram lá portanto o número de movimentos é dado por 2 elevado a n menos 1 um. menos 1 um não nos põe portanto 2 elevado a n Menos um, sendo é um número Mais tarde, no décimo, décimo primeiro, décimo segundo ano, quando se dava o princípio de indução, também é possível demonstrar isso, essa fórmula, utilizando o princípio de, de indução. Um, aqui neste, neste sítio pode-se ver, parece que houve 
o desabamento e foi o que aconteceu. Apenas posso mostrar o que era, que eu acho que é lindíssimo, e uma oportunidade de chegar à mão é esta revista, que uma palavra que eu não conhecia, metagrobologia, que é o estudo dos pássaros. Thank you so much, Rita Vieira, for your uh, nice video. I feel like to spend, to hibernate a whole winter in this house, in, in the Rita house. It's just solving puzzles. Um, so we finished just in time for the last, um, the last talk of this session. It will be given by um, Rinos uh, Ruels. Uh, he is... Uh, a mathematician and artist based in Netherlands. He studied applied mathematics and took a degree from the Exed Art Academy with specialization in sculpture. So, Rinos, you have the word. You can start. Okay, thank you. Um, well, um, my, my main profession is a sculptor, so not a mathematician, but um, I like mathematics a lot and um, my sculpture are mainly about mathematics. Um, sometimes it starts with uh, very simple mathematical problems, uh, like this one. Um, so imagine you've got a cube and you ask yourself, uh, how can I divide this cube in three equal parts? Well, mathematically spoken, it's a very simple problem. You just can slice the cube in three parts and the problem solved. But as an artist, uh, I'm not satisfied with uh, such a solution. So um, I was thinking, how can you do it in a more artistic way? And uh, my solution, well, is this one. So here you see the, the cube. And when I take it apart, you will see that you end up with three equal parts. The parts are more interesting and uh, also the the set of the parts is interesting because you can combine two of those parts in several ways, in such a way that the third part doesn't, doesn't fit in. And uh, well, there are a few possibilities to do this. So only in this situation, the part fits in. And now I can also turn it and put the third part in it like this. So this solution is, is based on the threefold symmetry you got if you have the cube in this position. You now see that the three parts can be shown in this way. So this is the way I, I try to uh, explore mathematics in an artistic way. And um, after I've solved this one in my way, uh, I try to make it a, a little bit harder. So. This was a cube divided in three equal parts. So what if you, uh, what can you come up with if you try to divide a cube in two equal parts? Well, in mathematics, it's even uh, more easy, but uh, in my way, my artistic way, I came up with this solution. You can clearly see that, uh, well, there are two different materials, so uh, two parts. But you see four different levels. So one, two, three, four levels. But still, it's a dissection of the cube in two different parts that, that can, come, uh, can uh, come apart. So like this. So and now you see the two equal parts. And together, in this way, it's the cube again. So it's another approach of mathematical problems in, in a way. And um, 
so basically that's the way I work. I, I try to find uh, interesting mathematical structures and uh, try to play with it in my way. Uh, another example I would like to show is this one. Um, you recognize the tetrahedron. And also uh, for this one, I uh, found a, a really interesting dissection of a tetrahedron in two different parts, or two equal parts. And uh, it comes apart like this. And so now you have two equal parts. And you can oh, <laughs> put it together again like this. And I don't know if you noticed, but um, in this case, I used uh, a spiral, a helix, uh, going through the tetrahedron. So in a way, it's just like a spiral staircase in which you lower one of the parts and you can add it again at the top and make the room again to make the tetrahedron. So another example of uh, an artistic dissection. Um, the next example I would like to show is, is this one. This is a table with uh, a triangle at the top and a square at the bottom. And with just a simple movement, I can transform this table into a table in which the square is on the top and the triangle is on the bottom. This has all to do with uh, combining different patterns in mathematics. And um, well, uh, in fact, uh, the inspiration came from uh, uh, Judani, uh, who showed how you can transform a square into a triangle and uh, I used it to make this nice table. So in this table, you see a combination of the triangle and the square. And um, so it's very nice to make combinations of different mathematical shapes. Uh, another example is uh, what we all know as mathematicians is, um, can you make a shape that fits exactly to these three holes? And the shape, well, the solution is, is this one. It fits exactly to the, the triangle, to the circle, and to the square. So this was a known solution. And uh, another approach of me is um, when you've got a mathematical problem that is solved, um, try to solve it in another way. Try to find a second way to solve the problem. So can you make a combination of those three mathematical shapes into one object. Well, the solution I found is this, this one. So you can definitely see the, the triangle, but you can open up this object into the circle, but you can also open it up into the square. So this nice object, is another way to make a combination of the three mathematical shapes, the triangle, the square, and in the circle. So combining different patterns and different, sphere, uh, different shapes has a lot of possibilities. One of my big uh, inspirations, uh, you know, uh, inspirator is uh, M.C. Escher. Uh, the well-known Dutch graphical artist. And um, he made a lot of uh, different patterns, tilings, tessellations. Uh, this is a, a famous one. You see the tree lizards. And I found a way to combine this with another uh, pattern that he made. And uh, well, to, to come to that other pattern, um, you just have to split this up in three parts. And now when I just rotate the parts like this. I can again assemble the parts. And when it's assembled, you see that the lizards uh, have gone and it's replaced by the three Chinese men. So when you look at the other sides, you don't see the lizards anymore. It's just a transformation of the lizards into the Chinese man. 
So one pattern of Azure transformed into another one. Now we've come to Azure. Um, there's another thing I like to show uh, that Azure made. And uh, there's this nice pattern. Um, it's a, a kind of grid uh, that you can find in, in several buildings uh, if in front of windows, a bar grid uh, made by bars, single bars with just openings in it so that other bars can go to it. Um, well, the way Azure did it uh, with this pattern uh, is such that uh, you cannot disassemble the complete structure. You can move it in a lot of ways, but it, can, it cannot come apart because the openings of the bars are just, uh, well, it's go through, it's go around, go through, around. So it's a very nice pattern in, in which you create a bar grid uh, which cannot be dissembled. Uh, you find a lot of bar grids like this, but uh, all can be dissembled because the pattern is different. Um, well, I found this so in interesting that I tried to find uh, other uses of, of this nice pattern. And one of the things I found is this one. Um, what you see here is a sphere uh, in which you can recognize the same uh, bar grids with the openings and the other bars going uh, to it. Uh, but in this case, you can recognize the octahedron. You see the triangle shapes on the sphere. And when I take it like this, you see that it transforms into a cubical shape. So we can use this one to explain something about duality. It's the cube and the octahedron in one object with use of the, the Azure idea of the bar grids. Um, because it's uh, about duality, you, you can make other examples. Well, I made this one. So here you can recognize the triangles again, and uh, in total uh, 20 triangles. But uh, when I take this, In my hands like this, it transforms into the dodecahedron. So it just rambles into the, the icosahedron again. And in between, you've got another polyhedron. So what we see now is that um, we can make use of, of holes and make combinations of, of different uh, objects. Um, well, uh, here you see two tetrahedra entwined to each other, and that's possible because uh, in each of the tetrahedra you've got holes, so you can make an entwinement of the two different objects. So it's just two equal objects, but uh, well, they can't come apart because it's, it's printed in one, in one piece, uh, but it's a nice combination of, of two equal objects by the use of the holes. I've got another other example here. So in this one, you see the square faces and the triangular faces. So in fact, in total, you've got a cube of tahiron, but uh, the, sev the, the sev several, the, the parts apart are the cubic ones with the squares and with the triangles, you see the octahedron. So a combination of octahedron and cube to form this yeah, combined object, which you can call or, or see as a uh, cube octahedron. Um, playing with, with holes is, is very interesting in, in my uh, profession. Um, well, when you look at this one, you also see, you see here uh, one part is going through the other by the use of holes. But um, now, because the total structure, you can see that this part goes through this one and comes back in this one, goes through this one, comes back here, and now it goes inside itself. So in total, you've got one complete object and not two different objects like the other ones. And um, so th this explains uh, something about uh, odd and even. Uh, 
when the number of going throughs is, is odd, you, you end up with just one single object. And when the number is even, you've got two entwined objects, like in, in the other examples I showed you. So the use of holes uh, is very interesting in, in, uh, in making sculptures. Another example is, is this one. Um, here you also see holes. And uh, yeah, special about this uh, object is that uh, it's a cylinder, but uh, it's a cylinder with a knot in it. So it's a knotted cylinder. Uh, it's maybe it's hard to see, but uh, when you start here, it goes inside here, you come, it goes, comes out here, and then it goes back and comes out here again, over here and over there and ends up here. So in total, it's, it's just one object. You cannot move the, the parts because there is only one part. Um, I make it, can make it more clear when uh, I cut off just a piece of the object. So now you can really follow the line it goes back in here, and here you end up at the upper piece. So now we have combination of, of using uh, holes, but there's another shape, a mathematical shape that uh, is introduced here, and that's the knot. The knot is, is uh, yeah, a very interesting uh, yeah, structure, and uh, it isn't explored uh, that much in in, uh, in in sculptures, but um, well, I thought uh, it, it needs some more attention. And the first thing I, I made with the knot is, is this object. Um, you see here an object uh, which has apparently two different layers, but uh, when you look at this side, you can clearly see the chief foil knot. And that makes that it is just one complete object which has two different levels, as you can see here. Um, this is just uh, one single piece, one single knot, but it becomes more interesting when you add more uh, of those units. And uh, well, what you get then is uh, an object like this. So here in the middle, you see a knot, and here again another knot. And when you look close, this knot is connected to the other knot. So you just have to look at the lines, so not at the material, but at the outline of, of the hole, and you see that the holes are connected now. And that makes it, you've got a very interesting structure. It's apparently uh, a structure made by two different layers. Uh, but you cannot move the, the layers. So it's just one single object, just because of the use of the, of the knots. And from here on, I, I played with, with this idea of using knots. And um, well, when you look at this object, you also see knots. And uh, well, here you see the fivefold knot. And it's connected with another fivefold knot, and it makes a very nice structure, which, well, it, it really looks like two different layers that you should be able to move, and you don't see any connection between the layers. But you cannot move it because it's just one. It's not two different layers, but... So it's not an environment, but it's just one single object. This kind of objects uh, are really weird, and um, well, it's, it's best to experience it uh, when you, you take it in your own hands and examine it and look how it's going over and under, and then you see the, the, the beauty of the object. I've got just one other example, um, so another pattern, but also here I made use of the same technique of using a knot shape, which you can see here, again, the fivefold knot, and you get this kind of structures. Well, in fact, you can transform any pattern um, into 
uh, such a, a knotted surface, um, the only thing you need is um, patterns in which you have uh, odd numbers of lines coming together in, at one point. So this has to be odd uh, because, uh, well, with four, you don't get a knot. You, you just get an entwinement of two circles. With three, you can get a knot. With five, you can get a knot, etc. Of course, we also can use it in uh, three-dimensional shapes like this. Uh, so based on, on a polyhedra. Uh, this is based on a cube. Um, you can really recognize the tree foil knot, and it's at, at every of the uh, eight vertices of the, of the cube. So there are eight knots which make this object. And when you look close at this object, you can see that um, it, it looks like a cube in a cube. Uh, below every surface at the outside, you see a surface at the inside. So it looks like a cube in a cube, but it's not a combination of two cubes. It's just one double cube. So a nice chapter in, in polyhedra. And, uh, well, as said, you can apply this technique on a lot of different uh, objects, a lot of different polyhedra. Uh, as long as you've got odd vertices, uh, then you can transform a vertex, in this case a fivefold, into a fivefold knot, and you get this nice double snub cube. So many more possibilities, but um, well, I leave it to this one. When we go back to the uh, 2D structures, uh, you can make entwined structures like this. And you see that this is uh, a combination of three different uh, yeah, equal patterns, but it's an entwinement of, of three different ones. Um, my idea was uh, to transform this into a, a more three-dimensional object by using this pattern, pattern uh, as a, a cutout or a plan for an icosahedron. You see here the, the triangles. And when you've got a triangle and net, you can cut out the right net to build the, the icosahedron. And what you get then is uh, this nice object. And because I started with three layers, uh, this also has three layers. But because here, the hexagons are becoming pentagons, we get the same effect of the knots. But now we've got a higher level of knot. knot. Uh, this is the 10-3 knot, uh, the, what you see here. And well, it's based on uh, the 10-sided the, the, you know, the, the polygon. But uh, there's a 10-3 knot that you can make on that polygon, and uh, that's three uh, the replacement of, of this hole. So very complicated objects, but uh, very easy to explain how you can design them and how you can realize them. Well, I was talking about higher level knots, and um, so also in 3D, uh, 2D structures, you can use those higher level knots. So here I used uh, well, the, the eight three knots as the basic shape, and you end up with one single thing, but uh, now with three different levels. And well, using higher uh, num uh, higher knots, uh, you can make any yeah uh, number of level in just one single structure. Structure becomes very elegant, and uh, it's hard to believe that it's just one single surface that's entwined by by itself so to say. So um, we've been, been talking about uh, holes. Uh, holes as just holes in, in this way. So when uh, where objects go to each other. Uh, holes in more complicated ways, like in, in this one. So the holes here become becomes a, a knot. So we make use of knots to make the holes in the structure. 
and that uh, that gives us very interesting new structures. Uh, another type of hole that I explored is a helical hole, and therefore I have this example. Um, as you can see here uh, in this object, you also see holes, but the holes are helices going from the front to the back of the object. And so we again get one single surface objects, but now in a very different way. So the helix is also an interesting, interesting mathematical shape that uh, I can use to, to build new structures, new objects. Um, interesting about this one is uh, that when you look close at the object, and uh, especially when you look at the space in between the material, and you study the shape of the shape in between, you can conclude that the shape in between the material has exactly the same shape as the material itself. So it, in fact, uh, this object divides the space in two equal parts. And that makes it possible to use two different parts that go together like this. So they are totally entwined, as you can see. They are equal. The, the white one fills just uh, the, the open space of, of the first one. Well, it becomes even clearer in, in this object. So here I used the same technique of the helical holes. So you see the holes going through the object to the other side. Uh, it's based on another pattern, so not on the square pattern like this one, but a more difficult pattern. Uh, essential for, for this kind of objects is that um, when you use a pattern to, to make the helical holes, you always have to, to look at patterns in which you can have uh, left turning and right turning next to each other. So this one is left turning, right turning, left turning, right turning. So in fact, you have to start with uh, a tiling, which can be colored in with just two colors. So black, white, black, white. So this is based on the checkerboard, and this is based on a more complex pattern. And in this, in this one, you can very clearly see that uh, the space in between the material has exact the same shape as the material itself. So I can put one such object exactly to it. But it also means I can split the object like this. And now again, you see that the space in between the material has the same structure and same shape. So this object shows very well how you can divide the space with helical surfaces. I have just one more example. Um, so this was, is based on the hexagonal pat pattern, or in fact, a triangular pattern, in which six triangles come together at one point. And when six triangles come together, you can divide them in black, white, black, white, black, white again. So here again, left turning, right turning, left turning, right turning, and it fits exactly, and you get this object, which again, also can be doubled in this one. So you can put one inside the other and they cannot come apart, but uh, it fits exactly. So now <coughs> a few more examples of uh, what, what you can do with those helical holes. Uh, when you've got a black and white pattern, you can transform it into a helical hole structure. And uh, this nice Archimedean spiral tiling is so also one single object again with the nice helical holes. And also here, left, right, left, right, combined. So a lot of possibilities with those helical hole shapes. 
As a final example, I've, I've got this one, a nice sphere. It's uh, again, just one single uh, surface. And because of the helical holes, so you see the, the fivefold hole, it's turning one side and the triangular holes are turning the, the opposite side. And together you can make this object and in fact, you can add as many layers as you want um, because the, the pattern repeats and it stays one single surface, which is uh, which has the possibility to make it infinite. I be became more and more interested in the in the helix, and um, also in in just simple polyhedra, you you uh, can see the helix. Um, this is called the tetrahelix. It's built with uh, only tetrahedra. Uh, when you glue them together, you, you get this nice shape, uh, which which has a, a sort of twist in it. So also a helix in here. Um, well, this one has three sides. So it's uh, based on the triangle, as you, uh, you, you could say. So it's a tetrahelix. But uh, it has a, a triangle, uh, yeah, uh, look from above, and you can extend those uh, things to squares, and you get the helical square. And well, you can go one step further, and here you see the pentagon as the basic shape for this helix, and here the helix is shown by the complete triangles next to the triangles with the holes. This one um, yeah, uh, was very inspiring for me uh, because here you've got a helix, you've got very simple uh, faces, just equilateral triangles, and uh, it's based on uh, the pentagon. But when you think about the pentagon, uh, there are two ways to make a pentagon just the outline pentagon, but also the star-shaped pentagon, like this. So I thought, uh, well, would it be possible to uh, use the star-shaped pentagon instead of the normal pentagon as the top view? Well, with some experiments, um, I was able to create this model. And here again, you see that now the triangles get entwined. But it's very interesting that um, we now have a, a shape uh, in which every uh, face is an equilateral triangle. And well, every vertex is exactly the same. So in fact, we've got a uniform poly polyhedra. And uh, this kind of shapes was not known uh, until <laughs> I found this one. Uh, so for me, it, it was quite an experience to, to have uh, uh, this new shape. Um, I studied it a little bit more and um, well, the second model uh, I made was this one. And uh, nice about this model is that uh, you can put it together quite easily. Because um, it's in fact made of pairs of, of triangles. And you see here a basic shape. And those shapes are just slit together. So you see uh, small slits in it. And when you, you can slide a pair, an extra pair over here and make it longer. So it's a complicated shape, which is, uh, well, quite easy to construct. And uh, you can only find this kind of solutions when you've got the first model, uh, which I showed you before. Uh, but when you study uh, your first model, you, you can come to this kind of conclusions. Uh, well, in that case, I made a few more examples. And um, they are also based on, on knots. So in this case, it's the 5-2 knot that you use, the pentagonal star. Uh, in this case, you see the seven fold star, seven two, and well, the object, the paper model is like this. And 
when you go one step higher uh, to eight, you can make the eight three star, like this one. So you've got the seven two and the eight three, and then the object becomes like this. So in fact, uh, with the discovery of, of the first model, uh, I discovered that it was possible to make an infinite series of new uniform polyhedra. There are different ways to, to uh, look at those objects. And um, one of the ways is to look only at the edges. And you see here an edge model. And when you look at the top, you get a nice view. And there's another one. So all the edges are edges of equilateral triangles. And uh, it's all connected, so it's one complete polyhedron. Well. Another way I went is uh, to make real sculptures uh, out of these structures. And well, uh, this is one of the sculptures that's really made. It's made in steel, uh, about three meters high, and uh, it's now set in Poland. Uh, again, when you look at the top, you can see the nice 5-2 star. And you get a nice complicated object. Well, because the, the, the complete series is infinite, um, well, I made a few more 3D prototypes. And well, it's always nice to have a look at the top. And well, this is a more complicated one. So it's possible to, to make a, a big series of, of, of nice sculptures and uh, based on this principle of uh, yeah, entwined triangles uh, in a helical uh, structure. Well, um, this is also the base of my, my PhD study and um, the, my thesis uh, is about uh, yeah, the theory behind uh, all these objects. And you see here a picture of uh, the real sculpture uh, in Poland. Uh, so if anyone is interested, uh, well, just contact me and uh, I can, we can talk about this a little bit more. Well, uh, this was what uh, I was, I wanted to say, and uh, I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Rinos. I am completely speechless. <laughs> This is incredible, and um, I don't know if you if you can if you have any questions. There is some space for for questions. Uh, you you can leave it in the in the. There is a special box, and there is also the the chat, of course. And I was wondering if um, you. I, I guess that most of these models were made with a three D printer, right? And yeah. There are there are probably some some uh, challenges to 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 print some of this uh, stuff in the three D printer or not. It, it depends on uh, uh, what technique you you use. Uh, if you use the cheap printers uh, which uh, melt a wire and make the object, then it's almost impossible to make the, this kind of objects. But um, I guess. The, the other group of printers is the powder printers. Uh, so you start with uh, yeah, uh, powder with uh, very small particles. Uh, the first layer of the, that powder comes on a plate, and with a laser, you draw the cross section of your object. And after that, the next layer is laid on the first one. And layer by layer, uh, the c column of powder grows, but uh, inside, only those parts that you need are melted together. So after the process is done, uh, you just okay. take away all the, the, the yeah. power that's not melted and you, uh, yeah, you have this one. And uh, with that technique, uh, almost every shape is possible. And well, you have to draw it, of course, but uh, well, uh, that <laughs> uh, I'm able to draw any yeah, uh, shape I want. So. Uh, that's not the problem anymore. You you always do a numerical uh, model of this because I, I saw that the, the, some of them were made with with paper. So you some, sometimes yeah. you start with paper and, and and wood maybe. 
Ja, de, uh, wood paper. Uh, ja, de, uh, well, let me see. Ja, yeah, these are just made from paper. So uh, you, you laser cut the parts. And uh, well, what I said, uh, the parts are quite simple. Uh, it's just two triangles with uh, a folding line in the middle and a few slits. And then you are able to make those complicated models. And that's, that's really fascinating that, um, that such a model can be made in, in a very easy way. Uh, if you yeah, think about what kind of parts you, you need and how you can construct the parts and how you can put it together, then you can come to this kind of solutions. And uh, I think this is really fascinating. There, there is there is an interesting question from Bernardo Cunha that says, I have this conception that most breakthrough ideas in mathematics arise when taking a shower or walking the dog in moments of absent mindedness. Are your ideas um, for your art also like that, arising on these kind of moments? Well, um, I've been thinking a lot about this. And um, in my thesis, uh, I spent a complete chapter about this. And um, one of them, the main points, I think, is um, uh, when it becomes too f uh, important to visualize mathematics, you need other people than mathemat uh, mathematicians. And um, it's, it starts uh, with uh, the book of Luca Pacioli, in which uh, he invited Leonardo da Vinci to make the drawings. So. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci was uh, challenged to, to visualize the mathematical ideas of Luca Pacioli. And uh, when you take another person than a mathematician, so an artist, then that person looks with different eyes to the same material. And mainly <laughs> then he comes to other ideas. And uh, so that's the point where, where inspiration starts. Uh, yeah, uh, look at the same material with different eyes. And uh, so th I started uh, studying mathematics for a couple of years, but uh, I had a, 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 a greater interest in, in sculpture. So I switched to sculpture. And um, then you learn to, to, to see with other eyes, but uh, well, I still have my mathematical eyes, so I can, could combine them. And uh, yeah, uh, then you got a lot of inspiration because you, yeah, you look in different ways. Someone said that uh, the artists work horizontally and uh, the scientists vertically. I would say that mathematics, it's the most vertical of all the sciences. Do you agree that you, you work horizontally? <laughs> no, that's not my vision. Uh, um, it is my vision that, um, well, uh, a lot of artists use nature as, as uh, the source of inspiration. And you wouldn't call that horizontal. And uh, what I discovered is that uh, next to nature, you've got other worlds and uh, mathematics is such an other world. Um, in mathematics, you see real, really other things than in nature. So if you are able to use mathematics as your source of inspiration, yeah, you've got new possibilities. But uh, I do not see it as horizontal or vertical. So um, thank you again for this wonderful talk. And maybe we can um, uh, finish this. this uh, there, is, there is one more. Uh, there is one. It's the same. Um, I, I, maybe we can uh, finish this um, session on uh, mathematic, mathematics mathematics. Um, uh, uh, <laughs> a, a recreational mathematics or, or or something like that and it was a pleasure to 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 have this uh, so nice um talks in this session and i hope that you enjoyed the rest of the the meeting the the spm the society of portugal uh, the the portuguese mathematical society meeting and i hope you appreciate everything thank you so much